Well, um, a warm welcome to Shop Talk Live. This episode, episode 37 uh, of our series, uh, is looking at Circle K. We're focusing on Circle K and also more broadly looking at mobility strategy for our industry. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to be assisted by my co-host today, um, uh, Klaus Mantel, um, who is uh, expert associate partner with McKinsey. Klaus, welcome. Good morning, Dan. How are you today? Very, very, very well. So, Klaus, as ever, um, you're helping me join up the time zones. Um, you're, you're calling in from at the end of the day from Tokyo. That's true. Yes, uh, almost six o'clock here. So nice to meet you and greetings from Tokyo, indeed. Thank you very much. Now, um, Klaus, just to just to kick off the episode, we've got an exciting program. We're going to be welcoming um, uh, the uh, the head of global e-mobility, Horkon Stickstrud uh, from Circle K, shortly to talk us through some of the latest sites. And then, of course, uh, Hans Olaf Heidel, who's uh, EVP Operations Europe with Circle K next, and then a panel session at the end. And you're going to be pulling together some key aspects of, of, of this uh, mobility strategy for our industry at the end of the program. So a great a great uh, sort of structure to today's episode. Just before we get into that, um, maybe I could pull up a couple of slides just to get us thinking um, about this. Um, I was uh, very fortunate to, to have the chance to, to see some of the latest stuff in Norway a few weeks ago. I made my first trip there um, since the pandemic uh, hit us. Um, funnily enough, Norway was my last trip uh, just before the pandemic in February 2020. Uh, as well. So you can tell how important uh, we think this market is. And uh, I, I find it fascinating. A picture, there's a picture of, of me uh, to, just to prove I went there um, at, uh, at uh, one of the Circle K sites. And really just maybe just Klaus worth just reflecting on some of the numbers coming out of car sales um, in this market. Um, in our next slide, this is some fairly recent figures from the Norwegian EV Association who do a terrific job in tracking this, and um, we're seeing, you know, some record numbers every month, aren't we, Klaus? Yeah, and that, that's why it's brilliant to talk about Norway today, right? Because Norway has always been very progressive on the convenience side, food offers, but now EV is what makes it special. So therefore, I think all of us around the world are watching it closely, and are very keen to hear what the Circle K team is telling us today. But the future, in many ways, is happening there first. So great. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think you know. Let's let's find out uh, where things are with Circle K in this market. Um, as I said before, you know, we're very pleased to to have two uh, terrific guests from Circle K on the program with us today. Starting uh, with Hawkon Stickstrud, who's uh, has the role of, of head of heading up global e mobility with Circle K. So welcome, Hawkon. How are you doing? Thanks a lot. I'm doing fine. Thank you. How are you? Very, very well, very well. Well, we we met recently when I was over in in, in Oslo, and um, it's a great opportunity, obviously, to 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 help the global uh, community in our industry catch up with latest uh, latest developments in Norway. Um, can you give us your perspective on on the pro progress of, of EV charging networks and infrastructure in Norway, and also perhaps um, globally uh, right now, Hawkon? Sure. Um... I can take you through that. Um, I think it's you know very good start to see see the graph you shown on, on EV penetration. Just to start reflecting on the market we're operating in. Um, so EV penetration in Norway has always been uh, always been high, sixty percent year to date uh, uh, so far. Um, and August had seventy one percent. September actually even higher, seventy seven percent. So it's just a massive EV penetration. Uh, but also, if you look at numbers, you know, outside Norway currently, I'm astonished to see the EV sales uh, this year. If you look globally, uh, the first half of 2021, uh, EV sales increased with 160 percent as opposed to last year. So that's a 2.6 index, which is a massive growth. Uh, also, Western Europe, uh, high amount of, of EV sales. We had 15 percent sales, I think, in, in September. Uh, you know, core Circle K markets like um, uh, like Denmark and Sweden as well, also seeing rapid growth now the last uh, couple of months. So, so this is the market we're operating in. Uh, the demand is uh, you know uh, is increasing when it comes to EV charging, and that's why we also see now more and more investments coming into charging infrastructure, not only in Norway, but I think we see this tendency uh, also uh, on a global level. Still, it's. I think it's behind EV development, uh, and I think there's a window of opportunity for for the players that 
that put out a great offer uh, now the next years. So uh, if you look at Norway and, and, and Circle K core markets, we have uh, in Europe, we have around uh, a thousand charge points uh, deployed on our sites, uh, Circle K sites so far. Uh, most of these are in Norway because this is our laboratory and this is where we uh, you know, applied mo most focus so far. Uh, around 600 fast chargers uh, on the Norwegian network. Uh, I would say uh, one third of the network is electrified with a good offer. Um, and um, uh, 240 of the charge points are Circle K operated, Circle K owned, Circle K branded, uh, whereas the rest are mainly partners such as Tesla and, uh, and uh, Ionity. Um, and this is growing. Uh, we're putting much more focus now to, to neighboring countries and Sweden and Denmark. Uh, uh, we've started investments there, and, and uh, we will apply, uh, you know, a heavy focus on uh, other markets as well. We think the timing is right for that now. Mm, very interesting, Klaus. Great. Yeah, I mean, impressive. Yeah, and and I think with the future happening first in Norway, of course, yeah, the, the duty of innovation is up to you. And we saw some amazing sites: yeah, Bembol, Kongsberg, Portland. Can you maybe talk us through some of those unique features of those locations, yeah, and, and how have you developed those? <laughs> Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, first of all, I think these are sites we are extremely proud of, not only in uh, Norway, but the Circle K uh, as a global company. I th these are two sites which which uh, probably are the first sites which is uh, are built bottom up uh, to catering to the needs of the future future driver. Uh, here you can see Bumble and you can see the, the large charge park uh, uh, up front there with the, we have 20 chargers from Tesla and we have uh, 20 lots for Circle K on chargers. We have 14 deployed so far there. So in total, 34 chargers. Um, in the behind, you can see a big uh, parking for the trucks uh, with a sustainable offer for, for uh, the truck and the B2B customers. There's, of course, the regular fuel offer here. Uh, and in the center of this all, uh, a great store. I think a great store with a lot of seating, uh, uh, good amenities. Uh, there's a great food offer, which... Uh, I'm sure you tasted. I hope you tested them. Uh, and there's also a click and collect payment uh, or, or pre-ordering solutions. So you can you can order when you're driving and pick it up uh, when you get there. Not showing on, on this picture, there's also actually a, a playing ground for, uh, for kids and, and families. So we think this site actually has everything you need for a good 20, 30 minute break. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, it's everything you, you could wish for uh, when you're out uh, traveling long distance. So this is a highway site uh, around the 200 kilometers outside Oslo. So it's a natural stop when you're traveling with your family or, or you know, alone, of course. Um, yeah, and here you can see some chargers. And this is Kongsberg Porten, which is uh, the, the newest site, actually. We've taken things a step further here. And we actually added the, and put the charge points up front of the store and under canopies. Uh, you can see it there. Uh, and the fuel um, area is, is not behind the store, but on the other side of the store. Uh, so very good uh, charge offer in place already and also room for expanding, uh, as you can see on this picture. We call this, um, this uh, site also a laboratory in the laboratory because we're testing out a lot of tech stuff uh, on the forecourt. Tech stuff we, we believe will be very important um, already now, but also in the future. We have solar panels on uh, all canopies, um, and we have batteries uh, on this site. Yeah, here we have a vacuum cleaner. I can just show you that. Uh, we have also added, uh, you know, services you can uh, you can utilize uh, when you are charging. So so this is something we're testing out. This is the battery station, and the thing is that uh, we're looking to optimize costs. We're uh, we are. Um, uh, you know, filling the batteries from the solar panels and also from the grid when the, when the price is at its lowest, then of course uh, deploying energy from the batteries to the chargers when the price uh, is at its highest. So I think this is very important, not only uh, of course in Norway, but also globally and in particular in markets with weak grids, we think this solution will be important for operational excellence. Um, and this project is being done with a, a local utility and also shows that it's smart to, to enter partnerships uh, to, to understand uh, and develop both technology and business concepts uh, in this area going forward. So, um, yeah, also a car wash on this site uh, uh, for, for the, you know, to create a destination uh, for a break. And also the store here is a, um, is a great store. It actually has two 
two uh, floors uh, to add seating capacity uh, for the great break. And of course, the fuel offer, you saw that uh, on one of the previous pictures. Great coffee, great seating. Uh, we have great traffic to these sites. Bumble has, uh, you know, extreme uh, amount of traffic and actually half of the four core traffic are electricity transactions. Uh, slightly less here at Kongsberg Porten, but uh, it's a newer site and it hasn't uh, taken up as a destination uh, to the same extent, but we expect the same figures there quite soon. So very proud of these sites, uh, guys. Yeah. I think we've got a little video just uh, just to, just to give the impression as you walk through the door on the on the Kongsberg Porten site. Uh, on, um, we we did try the food offer as you as you suggested uh, we should have done um, when we were there recently and it's uh, you know it's obviously very important and it's it's very good I have to say it's very good um, very good uh, very good quality and um, and uh, you know uh, good hot options some nice hot options there uh, for customers so I think very well. It's a great looking site, you know, I, I guess um, interesting class to hear some of the features there and, and just, I mean, some industry first, really, you know, so I think congratulations to to, 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 to you, Hawkon and, and the Circle K team. As you know, I was raring to get to the Bambler site for almost, it felt like two years, it wasn't quite two years. <laughs> Um, and uh, was delighted to have the chance of, of getting there recently. Um, well, just obviously thinking about all the industry interest in this uh, as, as the industry transforms itself, what are some of the key considerations for, for us um, when you invest, when you put this level of investment into, into these kind of sites? You know, maybe you could give us some insight on that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, well, first of all, I think uh, the obvious thing is, is timing, right? Every every player needs to assess their market uh, level of EV penetration and also you know apply that to to, to their own uh, strategy in the company so so that i think that's pretty obvious um, then of course um, it's about uh, choosing the right location so choosing a location that hits the most uh, applicable use cases uh, there's two use cases we see in particular which is relevant and that's you know charging when you're traveling long distance and you need to take a break uh, and the other one are you know, sites around the cities, urban main roads, which which will get traffic from people who don't have a home charter and also will get heavy B2B traffic and, and in general will get good traffic. So choosing the location is important. Then of course, you know, grid, <laughs> choosing the location is also about where do we, where is it electricity? And that's, I, I think we can talk more about that probably uh, a bit later, but um, sometimes uh, you actually need to adapt your location to where capacity is available. Um, and when you have chosen the location, it's about, uh, of course, configuring the site uh, the right way. Uh, in most cases, we don't have space for two value chains at the same time. I mean, we didn't plan for both charging and and fuel, uh, and, and now we need that as an industry. So, so space is a problem, and, and getting more uh, land is also something the industry needs to think about, and, and how to be, you know, creative to get uh, to get space on your forecourt. Uh, often, we find out that by playing Tetris, we call it, uh, you the pieces uh, fall together, and, and you you get the space available. But creating the sites which you've seen here with the big charge parks. Uh, for that, you need uh, a whole new thinking and, and more land. Um, I think the you know the last thing I'd like to point to is, um, and maybe the most important one is make it a destination. So do everything you can to make this a destination. Apply enough chargers there, enough capacity, uh, and also um, and also you know get get the good food offer in and, and the good store so people want to go there. Uh, that's my my uh, kind of last advice. Probably more things as well, but. Uh, yeah, feel free to to follow up. Very good, Klaus. Yeah, maybe two two follow up questions, right? Because I think big issues in the industry are, of course, demand charges, and then battery is the big hope, right? the peak mm. shaving. Mm. And so that's one question. And the second question I have is is the uh, operating the charge point yourself. Uh, you you operate about a quarter themselves yourselves and three quarters with partners. So how do you make that decision in the various markets? Yeah. I, good questions and, and uh, the topic of peak shaving as as so uh, I told on on Kongsberg, that's actually the first site where we where we've added that kind of facilities to understand you know uh, how important that will be and and uh, how that will work. Um, 
I think it's early days to, to give any learnings from that side, but except saying that we, we think it's critical and important and it's, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a competency and a technology that we, we need to have have. Um, and uh, when it comes to, to operation of this, uh, we feel like, um, um, I mean, if, for us, the strategy was early to, to get as much chargers out there as possible to make our sites destinations. So we wanted to, to cooperate with companies that, uh, that had capital to invest on our sites. And that's why we work with Tesla and, and Ionity. Uh, but again, I think it makes also sense to, to deploy an own charging network in the future. There's going to be traffic to these sites and uh, it's going to be a profitable operation. So why not uh, conduct that operation ourselves? So also there, it's a question about timing, right? Uh, but uh, when, it, when, when we talk about the end game, uh, we think it probably makes sense to, to control some of that operation ourselves. So that's our ref reflection around that actually. Maybe just a quick follow-up. Do you also see yourself operate charge points outside your fuel station network? Is that Great question. That... Great question. And, and yes, we are looking at sites and experimenting with that. Um, uh, we believe that, you know, there, and of course, certainly there are locations, occasions um, uh, in the future where, where, um, where the customer will choose uh, other places than our sites. And, and we're looking into to uh, applying uh, a network outside our sites as well, but but you know our our core network has the highest priority, of course. Very very good. Now, last question in this part of the segment. Um, just looking, I mean, looking looking broadly uh, at our industry. Do you? What's your perspective on, on on this? Do you feel that change is happening fast enough to match the speed of the OEMs? And Klaus is going to be talking about the OEMs' perspective on this at towards the end of the program. But what do you think, Orkon? Yes, so, so um, that's a you know very good question, and uh, I I don't want to be the judge of the industry here, uh, and I I cannot claim to see all markets. I may mainly focus on the Circle K uh, markets myself, but but um, and we've seen Shell, we've seen BP, some of the big players have taken positions and and, and are increasing positions. Uh, we see locally, for instance, a player in Denmark, Sweden called OKQ8, OK which is you know quite impressive. But if, you, if I were to give an answer, I would, my answer would be uh, no, we aren't moving in the pace uh, required. Uh, reason for that is, you know, you'll talk about the OEMs, the massive investments being done by the OEMs, 20, 30, 40 billion euros or dollars uh, each the next, uh, you know, five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a whole lot of EVs out there. I think the society will also see that the, that the electrification of transport, it's really a quite you know painless method of reducing uh, co2 emissions uh, it's actually a quite pleasurable uh, one it's it's nice to drive an ev so i think penetration will accelerate and it will go quicker than we see in the forecasts and based on that uh, also seeing the you know the market dynamics charger development will happen uh, after demand um, uh, is there and because many people will or companies will wait with investing uh, there will always be, I think, a lag in charger network uh, compared with the EV penetration. Uh, so as I said in, in the beginning, I think there's a space and a window of opportunity for companies that play on offense uh, and create great destinations. Uh, I think the customer will really reward that. Uh, but you know, through the nature of, of this market, I think the whole charger market will be slightly behind EV penetration. Uh, and that applies to fuel retailers as well, of course. So, well, yeah, yeah great, great answer, um, you know, and, and to all the questions as well. Well, first, I'd like to thank you, uh, Hawkon, for, for joining us today. Congratulations on what you and your team have, have, are doing, you know, because obviously it's great to be able to showcase that and, uh, and, and give, you know, just give you credit for, for, for being on the front foot, I think that's uh, that sums it up really, um, and that's what our industry has to do. We certainly believe that, Klaus, don't we? Yeah, absolutely, right. And it, it's a privilege for the industry to have this opportunity. In other industries, if I think about the iPhone uh, taking on taking over the business from Nokia in the space of a few years, uh, this is going to be slower, and we can all learn from from Norway and really uh, yeah benefit all of that. And I think that the key message around speed is an important one, right? So thank you, Holcom, for that one.
Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Hawkon. Well, just we're going to be uh, uh, inviting our next guest, uh, Hans Olaf Heudel, on shortly, Klaus. But, but you know, while uh, while while we get that ready, um, any reflections on 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 what we've seen so far? Yeah, I think it's a lot of lessons. Yeah, I think stations will be much bigger in the future. Yeah, and I think that is that is a key point here. Also, building future-proof stations because even in the lifetime of these of these pioneering sites, there will be a tremendous change coming, right? So it's, it's being agile and, and I think Sokke is doing really an impressive job. Great, great. Well, um, just need to ask you to unmute um, your microphone uh, as you have Hans, uh, Hans Olaf. Hans Olaf, um, at your EVP Operations Europe at Circle K. It's great to, great to hear what your colleague um, Hawkon has been saying. I'm sure you're very proud about what you've achieved so far in the Norway market. Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, we have uh, one of the best EV teams uh, in the world, actually, and uh, it seems like uh, the Kongsberg port you refer to has uh, become a destination for, for many players uh, around the world to come and see what we do there. Yeah, we, we, you, you need them all to be charging when they, when they arrive, I guess, and that site will, will be doing really well, won't it? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, and we're obviously going to be talking about uh, EV, but also looking more broadly at, um, at some of the exciting stuff, you know, frankly, that, that uh, Circle K are, are, are doing in our industry. And it's great to have a chance to, to, to do that. <clears throat> uh, do you think the picture looks clearer than it was two years ago, which I guess was the last time that many of us had the chance to visit um, Norway and Circle K? And, and if so, how, uh, Hans Olaf? Yes, to, to start with, you know, EV is actually a part of the sustainability journey. And, and what we see is that uh, the requirements or expectations become more and more consistent from customers, in particular B2B consumers, from policymakers and governments, but also from our own employee. So uh, this is a kind of, you know, thing we need to live up to, to be attractive, both from... Uh, the customer perspective and from the employee perspective. And I think we, we do an excellent job there in, in Circle K in, in many areas. On EVs, I think it has become much, much clearer now that uh, this is a uh, winning technology. Uh, you see all, all OEMs uh, moving into electricity. Uh, hydrogen uh, still have uh, a space, but uh, electricity becomes uh, clearer. I also learned uh, a lot, of course, by having Norway as a lab, uh, seeing what happens there. And uh, there is still much of the same needs from the customer side as it is with a normal uh, car, a fuel car. So we see this kind of expectation to make it easy. We see that uh, uh, amenities uh, plays a key role and even more key role on EVs. They are spending 20 to 30 minutes at our store. So toilet capacity, good food offer, free <coughs> Wi-Fi, seating capabilities, and of course, uh, excellent uh, human uh, interaction with the best employees is still important. What we also have learned, and this is in particular important, is that our location has a great value. Comparing to the average uh, charging in Norway, over chargers, has a much higher charging utilization than the average. So that, that tells me that we are in a winning space in regard to this uh, new offer. Very good, Klaus. Yeah, I mean, impressive, yeah. Just to broaden it a bit beyond uh, EV to overall technology, right? We see Circle K do amazing things with subscription models, uh, license plate recognition, frictionless payment. Can you say something about that, the role of technology in your business and how it's changing. Yeah, just as a start, I think, you know, on EV, the digital interface is much more important than we have seen earlier. You know, the OEM is putting a lot of effort into this. So winning in an easy digital interface with the consumer is important. But in parallel, by having Norway as a lab on, on EV, it's important to continue to develop our offer to the existing customer fuel, uh, normal fuel, then... Uh, uh, diesel and gasoline will continue to stay for many, many years and be the biggest income generator for, for, for Circle K. And it's important to continue to develop that and make it easy for the consumer in the same way as for EV. So 
recently launched the pay by plate solution in Sweden, the first market where we had that uh, on all stores. We're new, now moving in the, that solution into other European countries. And hopefully we could do that across the company as we move forward. On uh, click and collect is a solution that we speeded up the development for in, during COVID. It has been hugely successful in, in Norway as an example. Uh, home deliveries is another space that we need to continue to develop. We have some solution in, in the Baltics and some, some markets. I think this is coming as we move forward, but also other solutions like subscription model for car wash that we recently launched in, in Denmark, highly popular that we will now move to other markets. And then last but not least, also this more uh, uh, easy interaction with the consumer in the store, like, uh, like self-checkout solution. I think we have the scanning solution. The next solution in this area gets, goes much faster and is much less hassle-free for the consumer to gain speed. So I think this kind of interfaces need to continue to develop, but at the, in, in the same time, we shouldn't develop solution just for those who is the early adopters. We need to make it easy. So also all the average consumers can move into this space. And we see the same on, on EVs actually. Sometimes we make the solution to kind of complicated for the consumer, but it needs to be easy to use also for the 70 year old man that uh, doesn't have a lot of apps on her, uh, his phone to charge his, his car going forward. Terrific. And it makes complete sense, doesn't it? Doesn't it, class? You know, that sort of and, and uh, you know, congratulations again, you know, for for for, for pushing so fast uh, and so successfully on the digital side. The other thing I was going to just just throw in at this point was was looking at the food strategy, uh, which I know you've you haven't mentioned so far, but we'd like to ask you about because obviously uh, that needs to develop, too. And I know you've 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 you continue to you haven't been slow to move that forward either in the last couple of years. So perhaps I could ask you a bit about the, the food offer as, as well, Hans Olaf. Yeah, you, as you know, uh, Dan, we have a great food uh, uh, offer in the entire European uh, uh, Circle K stores. Right. Uh, this has been developed over many, many years. And today we are about 20% uh, in most of the business unit in regard to the in-store sales is food. Uh, we will continue to develop this. I think we will move a bit from uh, uh, prepared at say, site to more prepared uh, at the central destination or a central uh, distribution center. But we still want to make the food super fresh for the consumer. And in the future, I think we need to combine that more with like a click and collect solution, fast deliveries. And as I earlier said, when the consumer spent 20 to 30 minutes at our stores, they have more time and higher expectation in regard to having a, a great food offer. We are now also expanding this initiative into North America. So far, we have 1,500 stores there with uh, a good food offer, and we're going to drive that further and expand the offer to many more thousand sites in the coming years. Very, 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 very impressive, too. Um, Klaus, you know, and any, uh, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, reflections looking at the, the speed uh, with which Circle K are changing? Yeah, I think it's it's changed everywhere, right? And then maybe that was a question then to you, uh, Hans Olaf. People, uh, your staff on site, uh, their role must be evolving very quickly uh, from, from doing a fuel transaction, now much more hospitality. A lot of it is automated at some point. You get the self checkout. So, how, how is that changing your recruitment, uh, the um, uh, staff training? any retention challenges or, or not? How, how, does, how does that change the, uh, in your business? Yeah, so just to start with, I think uh, you know, people is the hardest one to copy. And uh, people has always, we are a people-centric company, an operational and pe a people-centric company. So it starts with uh, our employee. If you want to deliver a great customer experience in the store, you need to have uh, engaged, motivated and well-trained employees. And of course, all these new kind of offers, the digital interface, more food, more EVs, more service at the store level, puts higher requirements to our employees. 
So this is something that we always have focused on and we will continue to focus on. And it's all about, you know, get the right people into the store, but it's also much about engage them and try train them well. I'm very happy to see now that we was recognized for our gamified training that we have developed over the two last years, which is much more engaging for the employees. It's faster and it's easier to remember also all the new tasks you have to, to learn uh, and execute when you want to create a good customer meeting. But uh, it's also a lot about leadership. So uh, in one area, we continue to focus on the gamified part. We focus on uh, rewarding people in the right way, but we also need to focus on training and develop our leaders continuously to make sure that uh, we actually win. And, and revert back to that, the most difficult part is to copy a good culture and great leaders. Very good. I, I guess one comment on me uh, from me on that is that I, with the positioning of, of the Circle K business in, in Norway, particularly, and thinking about, you know, the rec what appeals to, to the younger, younger generations around obviously a strong forward, uh, you know, facing sustainability strategy. I, I think that's probably aided your recruitment of, of some of these new um, capabilities, hasn't it, Hans Ola? Yeah, you know, uh... I think everyone wants to, you know, be identified with something positive and uh, the high kind of focus uh, on environmental CO2 pollution have got uh, in the society. You know, young people ask this question when they are recruited. What is your answer to sustainability? What is your focus in regard to diversity and inclusion, uh, which is also extremely important and last but not least, they want to work in a company that uh, uh, see a solution for the future and uh, has a sustainability, a sustainable strategy to meet the future demands from the consumers. And I think uh, uh, we are on the right journey there. And I think we are rewarded by having excellent employees searching for for job in Circle K. Make, makes makes a lot of sense. Um, brings me very nicely to to my last question on this part of the segment. Um, Optimistic? Are you optimistic about the future in uh, in the Circle K business, Hans Ola? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, this uh, industry has always been through a lot of uh, you know of, uh, uh, changes. If you look thirty years back in time, it was workshops, uh, it was no food sales, it was lubricants and all the kind of products you had in the store. Now we are uh, more of a food destination, and I think you will see the same kind of uh, willingness to change and actually take off the opportunities when we move into the electricity journey in the, or era in, in the coming year. So I'm optimistic, but it takes a lot of, of hard work. Yeah, absolutely. We can, we can see that. And, uh, but you've done a lot. You know, it's amazing how much has, has changed uh, in all areas of the business as we've just been discussing over the last couple of years. You know, um, you've used that time incredibly well. So again, Hans Olaf, congratulations to you and the, and, and the whole Circle K team. And it's great to be able to feature you. I'd like you to stay on for a little bit longer, if that's okay, as we broaden the discussion into a, into a panel session. And, and also we're gonna finish up, as I said, with some, some McKinsey thinking and uh, McKinsey plus class mental thinking, looking more broadly uh, at some, some issues in our industry, just to finish up. Before we get to that part, let me welcome a very old friend of, uh, of ours, uh, Magnar Mokogard. Um, obviously, former, um, you know, spent many years uh, in the uh, in the in the uh, uh, right hand business uh, across the across the Nordics. Uh, hugely, hugely, um, hugely uh, experienced uh, guy in, in in the industry. And and Magnar, you you accompanied me to to on a road trip around the Circle K sites. We saw you we saw you featured in some of those photos. Uh, so you can't hide um, on the ones we just showed. No, I can't hide, and I think I also accompanied you on your last pre-COVID tour, so we saw the changes together. Yeah, it was fascinating, wasn't it? So thank you, yeah. thank you again for that. Just Magna, just thinking about your, you've got a great perspective, obviously, particularly on Norway as a consumer as well as a, an industry specialist on on some of the changes that uh, we've been seeing, um, particularly from Circle K in the last couple of years. Uh, any any thoughts on what we've covered and discussed so far? Uh, 
one of my, uh, my reflections from visiting those stores, and I've visited them several times. <laughs> I'll actually drive uh, by Kongsberg today. Uh, uh, that is that when you have this kind of one-stop uh, alternative for, uh, for the drivers along highways, it's very difficult to have the right size. At some times, uh, they are just too big. And, and, uh, and even though they are huge, at other times, they are too small. One of the things I remember most from our visit was the store manager uh, in Bumble who said that uh, sometimes during the summer season, her people had difficulties getting to work because uh, the line uh, for charging at the station uh, stretched all the way onto the highway. Other times uh, I've been there, uh, uh, there are so few people behind the counter that if something happens, a bus comes or something like that, uh, to have the right speed of service suddenly becomes difficult. It's a very good point, Hans Olav, isn't it? You know, and I guess in Norway particularly, maybe you get these uh, these challenges of of, of peaks. Um, you know, particularly in the summer season, as, as as Magna was pointing out. What's your what's your any any reaction on that point? I I think that is uh, an issue we have had always in in our industry, and you you can't always uh, you know build capability for the peaks, but uh, of course it's important to to have good labor models to to handle the. A lot of consumers when they come. I think also I talked a bit about this prepared food on site compared to uh, prepared before they come to the site to the site, and I think uh, that is also a part of the solution. So you still have a good offer, but you have prepared it before the consumer is there, and you have enough of it in in the store. So uh, another issue here in regard to electricity is of course uh, how to handle queues. That is uh, some of the frustrations for the consumer, and I think. Uh, all players uh, have something to develop there to be better and to to make uh, the 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 queuing uh, experience better also in in the future as little of it of course but when the queue comes up we need to handle it better than it has been handled so far i i think it's a good point i mean my reflection on looking at some of the sort of queue, queue issues that you get you know at peak times in in norway is is then extrapolating that out to other markets and um I don't know whether it's fair to say. I, I think my my impression is that Norwegians are extremely civilized and organized. Um, you know, it's a bit of a maybe that's a bit of a generalization, but but maybe there's some truth in it. But I think you know when we get some of those uh, queue issues in other markets, uh, it could be could be quite difficult to manage for the operators. Magna, I don't know whether you think thinking about some of your experience outside of Norway. Oh, I, I agree, but. I don't find that we are that organized in this country. And I think what Hans Olaf is talking about is very much uh, uh, electric cars are, char uh, are, are, are charged on different sides of the car. So you have to have the car coming to the right side of uh, the uh, charges. Uh, you have to somehow manage to get the cars to the right charges because uh, there are several types of charges there. So there are many Q issues that we are not really used to. And uh, I've also, uh, I've, for a long time, I've heard this Q issue as a strong argument against uh, electrification. I think the traditional one is what happens in, uh, in Florida if there's a hurricane coming uh, and uh, people need to charge on their way north. And of course, handing peaks is much more difficult with elect uh, electric chargers because it just takes a longer time to charge. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, quite. Klaas, any reflections on, uh, on, on any of that? Yeah, I think it shows that the customer experience still needs to be invented in many ways, right? Because uh, the queues, uh, queuing takes so much longer because the charging take so much longer and the infrastructure wasn't built for this. Yeah, so there's a job for the whole industry to think about how do we make it smoother, better? Is there going to be booking systems for charging? I'm sure all these kind of things will be invented and, and over time things will get better. Yeah, but again, uh, learning from Norway in this respect is, uh, is, is something we all have to do. 
And I, I guess Hans Olav, you know, the, the, the fuels network had a hundred years to develop, didn't it? And we're still, you know, there's still plenty of headroom for development in, uh, in the charging network. Absolutely. You know, pay by plate came this year after hundred years. So pay by plate solution or other kind of solutions with the, with the charging will, will come. We will have uh, well-organized queues, uh, hopefully in, in the future. And uh, as Magnar says, it's also about uh, the kind of uh, journey you have on the forecourt, uh, which side, uh, where to park, where to, to move, and you have done your charging. All these kind of uh, opportunities exist out there. And again, re reverting a bit back to the fuel retailers. This is something that we have worked on for many years. And I think we are well prepared to be with some of those who could develop the best solutions in the future also. But uh, it's more work to do in, in this space, absolutely. But I guess, you know, the, 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 the way you look at this in, in Circle K, and I guess that the way the industry should look at this is a positive. So if you're, as, as Hawkon was saying, on the front foot, um, well, there's lots of opportunity for differentiating your offer, making yourself a better destination than anybody else, isn't there? You know, in a way, it's a big opportunity, isn't it? Yeah. I, I see it like that. You know, a fuel customer, they want safety. They want uh, well lead stores. They want to have uh, good navigation. They want to have uh, good speed on the fuel pumps. And actually, it's much of the same requirements from the EV customers on top of all the other amenities that we can offer them when they spend this 20 to 30 minutes at the, at the store. So we think there is a lot of uh, good opportunities here. Uh, and a lot of good opportunities to continue to improve this journey. I, last year, I drove uh, 1,200 kilometers myself uh, in Norway with my own EV. Uh, and I must admit that uh, it wasn't always a good experience when I came to some of the chargers, uh, in particular some of the competitors, but not always as good, uh, uh, good experience on our own site also. And I think it's some of them is more difficult to improve, but uh, a lot of them has also have easy improvement opportunities. So uh, looking forward to the next time I take my 1,200K. <laughs> no, abs absolutely. Um, well, it just um, I think maybe this is a good point in the program class to, 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 to bring in yourself and of course some of the work that McKinsey have been, have been doing. And I, you've got a few slides, just three or four slides you're going to share with us and just talk us through a few thoughts, um, just um, taking a broader strategic view on this. Right, great. Yeah, if we go to the, the slide on the uh, this one in terms of the penetration, I think the future is happening first in Norway is the message, but it's only just starting, right? Because we always talk about vehicle sales being 60, 70% of new cars. I think the other metric of course is cars on the road. Yeah, and it's about 13% of cars on the road in 2000 were actually real battery electric. So it's only just starting. Yeah, so all these customer experience issues we're talking about, uh, there will be many, many more coming, right? So, and this is the key message to the industry to get ready uh, because it's only just starting even in Norway. I think the other message here, of course, it's, it's growing fast in, in Norway as the older cars are retired after let's say 15 years they're being replaced so that's why you see a steep curve and by 2040 feels a long time away it is a long time away but then we expect this to be largely battery electric overall i think the other message and i picked germany here as, as the largest market in europe yeah it's also projected to happen in germany but seven years later yeah, and that is where, where you see that's the other key message, the UK in our prediction even longer, right? So the industry has more time to prepare, yeah, but it's it's a new wave of competition because uh, customers can charge everywhere. So the, the fuel stations need to make this transition, but it's it's a big wave and, and it's coming. If you go to the next slide, one of the key things that is changing this, and this will help the other markets, is new exciting car models coming on the market. And with that, a lot of OEMs have announced They've stopped the R&D for the combustion engines They're going only EV in the near future. All the Jaguar, some Chinese players, also GM, Ford. So this will give a whole new, a, a new wave of excitement, new great models coming, but also uh, the supply of, of combustion engines will at some point dry up. Yeah, so these are just some of the big announcements that were made uh, fairly recently. I think the next slide talks a bit about the 
network planning, right? And this is the, I think, some great, I think, points about Hocon earlier at the moment, one third of the four courts at the moment for Circle K are electrified in, in Norway. Uh, we believe this is going to be a core competency for fuel retailers to develop. Uh, what is what we call the value pool uh, on a petrol station? Is there still enough value in fuel and associated convenience retail will that be sustained some stations will be more resilient than others and ev some stations are more well or better positioned to be that hub where people recharge and others you know in areas where people have a lot of home home charging opportunity uh, petrol stations are not very logical so then you naturally come to four quadrants. Uh, what we saw, of course, at, at Bamble um, and the other stations, that uh, the amazing stations there, Circle K is building the mobility hubs, extensive facilities, refueling, fast charging for now convenience uh, to go and to stay. Um, a lot of people like to still consume it in the car whilst they're being charged, right? So that is what gets a lot of attention. The other quadrants are, are equally interesting for the industry, top left. Some stations will be in areas where there will be a big wave of EV customers coming that don't have the opportunity to charge at home, for example, in, in big cities. And what you see there is probably fuel being phased out, EV coming in, uh, and you have dedicated urban EV hubs. If you look at bottom right, a lot of stations still have the opportunity to sell many, many things to people. I think some of the, you know, the UK, if you look at BP, Marks & Spencers, they'll always have a, a role to play. Yeah, and um, they don't really rely on fuel for their income. So therefore, they'll stay, they'll have fuel uh, still also in that neighborhood as people fill up, and there will be opportunistic EV. Uh, and bottom left, uh, this is the unmanned segment. Uh, there will be stations where, you know, there is not enough EV demand, uh, there's not enough fuel demand to sustain the, to sustain the store. So what you'll see here is, is a polarization of formats, uh, and this is uh, what we believe the industry should really look at uh, thinking five, 10 years ahead, what am I building now and how do I plan my, my, um, my network? So home charging access, EV adoption, convenience demand for now and for later, and grid access and the cost of that, uh, as Holcom mentioned already, are key considerations. So network planning really has to change. I think the final, final point on this slide is that, of course, we always see everything as an opportunity. Um, if you go to the next one, um, we see everything as an opportunity, but the bottom line is, Fuel, you can only buy the fuel station, whereas electric charging, you could do in many, many places. In our view, four out of five charges will be done outside a petrol station in the future. So therefore, fuel retailers are well positioned to access new value pools, and we believe they need to. Yeah. So beyond fuels, um, uh, is there non-fuels retail options, quick service restaurants, last mile already mentioned. Every, basically in the hospitality business as people stay longer also services uh, fleet solutions parcel pickup so really we believe that there's a need and an opportunity for the industry to reinvent itself as it's always done yeah, and the urgency comes around the choice that customers now have of, of where to put energy in their vehicle yeah so so lots of change coming or lots of change already happening so very keen to uh, yeah, to hear reflections from the team um on this and and how, how circle k is thinking about some of those challenges and let me frame a question for you uh hans olav uh, while you're thinking about some of the things that Klaus has said i suppose and i know this is something that again circle k uh, uh, really believe in but you know it, it, some obviously some operators globally are, are are not taking the front foot as far as ev charging is concerned and, and employing a wait and see strategy to a certain extent which obviously from an investment point of view has advantages in that you're waiting to you know, make sure you get the investment decision right. I suppose the disadvantage of that kind of approach is that you know, while you're trying to put together a, you know, a, 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 the structure of a new business, and class, you've you know, very ably showed you know, some of the opportunities, the value pools that are available in this new business, you know, it's quite hard to figure that out if you're not playing in the game, if you, you know, you're not all in on the EV charging component of this, isn't it, Hans Olaf? Yeah, just to, to start with uh, the, this, uh, you know, you need to you, you need to stay exactly just ahead of the curve. So if you move into this business too early, I think it's not smart either, because then you do a lot of investment in chargers and technology that uh, doesn't uh, are future proof to say it like that. Norway has been ahead of the curve. We have a lot of 50 kilowatt chargers in Norway. And that's not the future solution. So now it's 150 and 300, and maybe later 
much, much higher than that also. So I think it's smart to, you know, have a kind of not wait and see, but try to stay just slightly ahead of the curve as, as it develops in different market. And that's more or less what we do in, in Circle K also. Then uh, I'm, I'm agreeing with uh, the overview that, uh, that Klaus has on, on uh, the need to develop uh, more income uh, areas. And when we look at the EV journey, the EV customer journey, it is exactly as, as Klaus says, between 10 to 20% of the charging will happen at transit. Then most of the charging will happen at home or at the workplace. And we have solutions for those also. And when we, as we have in, in, in Europe, we have 50% of our market is B2B. And those customers, even more than the normal consumers, have requirement in regard to, to follow them in the entire customer journey. So we sell home chargers, we sell workplace chargers, and we sell invoice and digital interface solution to handle that for the consumers. And we have even now started the pilot in Norway to look at the opportunity to also sell electricity for home consumption. And that could both be done by ourselves or in partnership with others because the the electricity customer journey will be more and more, you know, uh, followed with higher expectation for, for, from the consumer in the future. The volatility on prices, we have just seen how much electricity prices have rise during the last uh, few months and customer want to have the lowest price and we need to help them with timing of charging and, and all this area. And this is something that we are into in Norway. It was uh, last year, I think it was the third biggest seller of home chargers in this market. So this is something we, we want to, to look at and, and offer our customers. Very interesting. Magna, um, any, any, any other points from you on, uh, on, 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 on what we've just been discussing, classes, slides? Just unmute. I think what we've uh, concentrated on today is very much the mobility hubs, the one-stop solutions for people on the move. We haven't spent too much time on the existing network. And um, I think that uh, Norway has now come to a point where we will really have a shakeout in uh, the existing gas station network as fuel sales drop and on locations that have a really high degree of competition from home charging. Of course, when you are at a place like Bumble, there is virtually no competition from home charging. People charge there to continue the, the journey. But if you're located in or around cities, it will become much more difficult and it will be become much more difficult to find enough new business to keep some of the stations alive. That's a great point. I mean, to, 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 your, to your slides, um, Klaus, I mean, network selection, you know, is a crucial and, and to, to Magnar's point, you know, regionally, and I think you mentioned, you know, California and the US as being the standout, you know, different difference in, in the US market. It's, it, it, you've got to be quite agile, haven't you, as an operator to get it right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and two points, I think one got a brilliant point, yeah, because the, the average petrol station that sells fuel and then sells, sells something to people who buy fuel, the candy bar, uh, the Coke, the cigarettes, is not going to survive, right? So those, those, those stations need to become destination for something and quite a few will fail. Yeah? So, so uh, the, the, there will be a wave of unmanned. Just on the other piece of network planning, I think then absolutely, right? Half of all the battery electrics sold in the US are in California. In Canada, 30% of all electric vehicles in the country are sold in the city of Montreal, right? So therefore, the future happens very unevenly at country level as well, mm -hmm. right? So this is where network planning is key. Uh, and and uh, with the long lead time of these projects, uh, having a good view of the future whilst, and, and really with Hans Olaf there, really being agile and moving at the right time, right? Because, um, yeah, that, that, so it's going to be super interesting times for the industry. Yeah, and, and we all need to make sure we're connected and learn from each other. Well, I, I think that, you know, couldn't be a better way of, uh, of bringing things uh, to, to a close today. Um, 
Klaus from Tokyo as ever, thank you very much for, for adding your massive knowledge on this subject and McKinsey's uh, research um, to, to the discussion. Uh, Magna uh, from your cabin in the, in the mountains, I think looking at the background um, in Norway, uh, thank you very much for, for all your assistance and, and great points. And, and, and I think we should finish by thanking uh, Hawkon and Hans Olaf, uh, congratulating Circle K for, you know, for really inspiring us, I think uh, is, the, is the word really uh, as to take the opportunities uh, that are that are coming in the in the new world for our industry and uh, thanks very much for joining us Hans Olaf thank you for having us thank you terrific well well that was shop talk live uh, looking at uh, circle k and the future of mobility pretty fascinating good afternoon <laughs>